And as you're all aware, aware today, uh, USGS uh, Subuto and Steve H are here to talk to us about the transition from NHD to 3DHP. They're going to give us an update where they are right now and the timelines. Uh, just a reminder for those of you that may be new to the program, uh, 3DHP for the Nation is a NISJIC USGS cooperative agreement, and it, we work with both organizations to engage state and local governments, the private sector partners, all towards the derivation of a 3D stream network and hydrologic units using LIDAR and IFSAR in Alaska. Uh, just a brief update on project activities. As you know, uh, we have a monthly forum. That is one of our activities, uh, facilitate a monthly information webinars. Uh, all of the recordings, uh, Q&A docs, and presentations are available at the NISJIC Learning Link. Uh, I know a lot of you had questions about accessing that information for the July forum. I do know that the presentation and the recording are up. We are still waiting on edits to the Q&A doc, so that should be up shortly. Um, and then the second task, establish a hydro 3D hydrography communities and online workspace. As you know, we have the 3D HP for the nation interest group. Uh, it's a general information group and where we get together, uh, we try to get together quarterly. Uh, the June 15th meeting presentation and, and recording are posted to the NISJIC learning link. Uh, for those of you that are not NISJIC members, you can access um, the learning link, you will have to create a login with the NISJIC website, but you'll be able to access those materials. Uh, you do have to log in to access those materials. And then our next uh, interest group meeting will be Tuesday, September 20th. Uh, during the NISJIC annual conference, we'll have a data for the nation breakfast. Again, that is a 3DEP and 3DHP inclusive meeting that we hold. Uh, and the topic will be hydro enforcement. And unfortunately, at this time, it's in person only. We are continuing to consider if we can uh, provide a virtual experience, but um, it doesn't look like that right now. Uh, we have the inventory of 3DHP experiences, and I'm going to put these links into the chat. Um, there is a short form and a long form. Uh, please. Please uh, consider sharing your experience and your activities with us. Um, very helpful. Uh, the next thing that we're working on right now is the development of some guidance materials. Uh, well, we, I'm sorry, we do the identify the task and we, pri we already uh, developed the critical factors. We've done a prioritization exercise on that. Those priorities are driving the other task. And one of the first ones is to develop some coordination support uh, some guidance for 3DHP coordination support. Uh, we have one document out there, put that into the chat that's been completed, just a one pager, handy dandy. Uh, we're currently working on part two, which is assessing your 3DHP data needs. And then the uh, objective at this point is to develop a third one on building funding partnerships, and that has not yet begun. Um, please check out the NISJIC for the Nation 3DHP Info Hub. Uh, Bill keeps that ripe with information and, and activities. Um, put that into uh, the chat. Oh, I did the same thing, didn't I? Let me get the right URL. Phil, can you put in the hub? I accidentally copy pasted on top of it. Uh, no problem. And and anyone who has any feedback or comments, please reach out to me directly. Actually, I found it, Phil. Sorry. Okay. Yes, please. If you have ideas, reach out to Phil. Excellent. Um, and then finally, 3DHP program feedback. Um, Phil, Abby, and I participated um, in the joint 3DHP 3DEP Federal Working Group joint meeting, and that was very informative. And um, one of our other tasks is to, as as needed or relevant, we review document strategies and resources and provide feedback on those items. Just quickly, I wanted to go over some of the activities occurring at the NISJIC Annual Conference. I went ahead and slid the three depth stuff in here as well. Uh, Monday, we'll be having a morning workshop taking stock at three depth for the nation. Um, we, uh, Emily haven't reached out yet, but Emily, I'll be reaching, we're going to set up a workshop registration 
um, for that. Um, Tuesday, there will be the Data for the Nation breakfast breakout we already talked about. Uh, in addition, the finalization of NHD, WVD, and NHD Plus, I believe, has been added. This is all tentative to the state caucus topics that day. And two presentations that have yet to be scheduled. Uh, Sue Budo, again, will be joining us to talk about the 3D hydrography program to the full community. And uh, there also will be a presentation, hopefully, it seems to be in the mill uh, for 3D Nation um, study results. And we look forward to that. So please watch the conference website. That's my last URL I have to paint in here for updates. And we're hoping all of you can join us at the meeting in Portland at um, September 18th through the 23rd, something like that. That is correct. OK, great. Uh, any questions on program, program activities, tasks, things like that? Be happy to take that before we uh, op uh, begin the presentation by USGS. All right, with that said, I would like to uh, introduce Sue Buto, who is the USGS Hydrography Data Acquisition Lead, and Steve Achel, the USGS Hydrography Program Management and Planning Lead. Uh, they will be talking to us today about the transition from NHD to 3DHP. I will stop sharing so that uh, Sue and Steve, you guys can share. All right, let me see if I can work this out again. There we go. Are we seeing a presentation? Not yet. Not oh. yet. Steve. You do have to hit the share button. It's a little confusing in Zoom. Yeah. Let me make sure you have privileges, Steve. Mine yeah, could be on me. me. Here, let's try. Let's try it again. There it is. There, there it go. is. All right. Okay. So I think, uh, I guess with that, Sue, you're leading off. I am. Thanks. And um, thanks, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate your time. Uh, next slide, please. So we like to start out, or at least I like to start out sort of with a, a look back and a look forward um, with topographic mapping in the USGS, which began in 1884, uh, where we uh, collected data nationwide to make our maps. And then at the advent of GIS and the digital age, we started stripping data off of those maps to create um, uh, digital data, and we entered an era where our maps actually were making our data. Um, and during that era, one of the things that, that happened because we separated data sources is our hydrography data and our elevation data became separated and moved in different directions. <clears throat> so now with um, 3 depth marching its way across the nation, um, as we collect high accuracy 3 depth data, um, we're now able to move into a, a new era where we're back to collecting data to make maps uh, so we can derive new uh, hydrography data from our elevation data that's aligned by nature of being derived from the source. Next. <clears throat> so quickly, I'll, I'll run through the, this new um, uh, concept or this new initiative that we're moving towards um, in the National Geospatial Program, and that's the 3D National Topography Model. And this is a, a sort of a movement, a next step in the vision of the 3D nation, which is building a continuous elevation surface from the depths of our waters to the peaks of our mountains. And with the 3D National Topography Model, that includes now um, integrated hydrography data, as well as inland bathymetry. So we truly um, would end up with a, with a complete elevation surface. So um, ongoing efforts towards the 3D national topography model 
our completion of our national baseline data sets. And I'll focus on the 3D elevation program data, which at the end of FY21 was 84% uh, of the nation either um, complete or in progress with data. Uh, and we'll make some more inroads um, this year when we have the final numbers uh, put together. And then the next step that we're actively working on is um, defining and, and standing up our next generation programs. Um, and those are the 3D hydrography program that we'll talk about today and the next generation of 3DEP, which is in uh, under development uh, as we speak, um, partly driven by the results of the 3D nation study that you guys are all aware of. And then our longer term goal is to develop uh, the 3D national topography model. Um, so the, our current approach to our national hydrography data sets, as many of you are very well familiar, uh, are the national hydrography data set, the watershed boundary data set, and the NHD plus high resolution. And the NHD, I guess the portfolio of data sets um, are really arguably the most comprehensive and current data of the nation's surface water. Um, and our management um, uh, technique to date has been that the NHD and the watershed boundary data set have leveraged local knowledge and direct updates to the data through our stewardship program, which has participants in 41 states in Washington, DC. But as I mentioned um, earlier, our data sets do not, our hydrography data does not necessarily align everywhere with our high resolution 3 depth data. Um, and so that um, is an issue that we're tackling going forward. Next slide. And the 3D hydrography program and hydrography derived from elevation uh, offers a solution to realign our topographic data. Uh, so the goal of 3DHP is to acquire, <clears throat> excuse me, new hydrography that's standardized to align um, with our 3D data. Um, including some other um, improvements that I think Steve will go um, more deeply into in his section, which um, delves deeper into the data itself. Um, uh, the key here, too, is that the data acquisition processes will follow our 3 depth best practices, <clears throat> including best practices around data acquisition. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but we aren't throwing away what we have with the NHD and the WBD. Uh, we want to build on those, the decades of work that's gone into those data and the concepts that um, have moved those data into the position that they're in now. Next. So in 2016, we did a study, so we're not sort of just making up the, the need for these data out of whole cloth. We did a study and we... Um, documented um, over 400 mission critical business uses um, after uh, surveying or conducting a survey with 23 federal agencies, 50 states, eight tri tribal governments, and our national associations. And the study, the HRBS, found that hydrography data are essential to your applications and applications across the nation. And the current data provides an estimated $538 million in annual benefits. Um, but the study also found that a modernized 3D enabled hydrography program uh, could provide up to over, over 1 billion annually in benefits. That's if all our user requirements are met. Next. So digging a little harder into the deeper into the um, uh, hydrography requirements and benefits study, we came up with three uh, scenarios for updating our hydrography data. Um, I'll quickly mention that the third scenario is actually not really feasible for us at the moment. The 3 debt program is, is um, based on QL2 or better LIDAR data supporting one meter DEMs. Now there's a lot of QL1 and better data um, across the nation, but not consistently. So we wouldn't be able to do a consistent half meter DEM across the nation. That may be something that we can do in a future iteration, depending on what the next generation of 3 dep looks like for us. So scenario one was keeping the status quo. And in the, the status quo, the data consistency across the nation would vary by steward. 
Um, some states don't have resources to regularly update the data, and some states have a lot of resources to do so. There's, so there's a little bit of data inconsistency state by state. Um, and the um, really major advantage of these um, of scenario one is it would be the lowest cost um, and really the lowest risk in a lot of ways. But major needs that were identified in the HRBS would be left unmet. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at scenario two and um, we chose that as the most beneficial um, middle ground scenario. Uh, where we would derive new hydrography data from one meter three depth DEMs to gain consistent nationwide coverage, again, that's aligned with our elevation data. Um, the advantage of this scenario is that it will meet most needs, but a challenge in the scenario is that it will require significant increased investment from USGS and from our partners to achieve. Uh, but I will say that the annual benefits are um, estimated to be, again, a little over $1 billion. Next slide. So um, one of the keys to the, to the 3DHP and the vision for the 3DHP is supporting the Internet of Water. Um, so there's, there's a lot of water-related data that's collected across the nation. Uh, from many agencies and entities, but we lack a systematic way to organize and discover it. And so USGS and our federal partners are developing a um, information infrastructure for federated sharing and discovery of water uh, information in the context of the stream network. So being able to search up and down stream, the stream network to find uh, information from many, many sources in one search. Um, and 3DHP is envisioned to provide the geospatial underpinning for the Internet of Water. So that means that um, it's key to us that we have um, the ability to, to connect and find data on the, on the network. Next slide. So another key and another sort of change in the way we're approaching or we have in the past approached um, hydrography data is that 3DHP will follow um, 3 dep best practices in data acquisition and data governance. Um, so we are um, working towards adding 3DHP to our 3 dep broad agency announcement uh, to solicit partnerships to the broad community to, so the community can um, uh, invest in updating our uh, hydrography data. Um, for those of you not familiar with the broad agency announcement, it's our uh, vehicle by which we can partner with um, non-federal entities. Um, and the intent is to contract acquisition of 3DHP data, primarily through our USGS geospatial products and services contracts to um, assure that we uh, end up with a consistent data product nationwide. But we will, I, I suspect, eventually allow for um, some cooperative data acquisition um, uh, through uh, financial assistance agreements similar to 3DEP and also for contributed data. And another key here is to provide specifications, much like the, the LIDAR-based specification. Um, and we have, uh, have that process in place. We have um, specifications and read rules in, uh, already published, and we're working towards or we've started um, versioning those as we learn um, more about uh, elevation-derived hydrography uh, as we actively work in Alaska uh, on uh, deriving hydrography from the IFSAR data and piloting uh, data acquisition in uh, the continental US. Next slide. So I just want to sort of end my section with, with this idea that there's everybody in our community has a role to play uh, in the 3DHP going forward. And USGS will manage these data on behalf of our community, uh, but all of our partners, our federal partners, um, state and, and local partners in the private sector all have roles to play in helping to acquire the data um, and in governing the data and in, in deriving technology innovation and new applications for the data. Next slide. And with that, I'll pass it on to Steve. All right, thanks, Sue. So uh, just to touch on a couple of the points that Sue mentioned, emphasize them a little bit. Um, 
you know, there are a few goals, few overarching goals of uh, 3DHP. You know, one is one is obviously to replace uh, that older inconsistent data uh, with data that agrees uh, vertically, horizontally, and temporally with our three depth data. Uh, we've invested a lot in uh, getting really you know, outstanding elevation data for the nation. Um, we need to have hydrography data that uh, works with that uh, elevation data. Uh, similarly, we've learned a lot through 3 uh, in terms of governance, in terms of acquisitions, um, in terms of uh, how to do uh, how to do specifications updates, and you'll see uh, a lot of parallels between uh, the way 3DEP uh, has been managed and the way uh, uh, 3DHP will be managed going forward. Um, finally, there, there are things that we can do in, uh, in a modern data model, a modern data environment that really uh, were maybe not even possible, were certainly exceptionally difficult in uh, the NHD data, data model. Um, these are things like you know, providing, uh, providing good connections to groundwater, uh, providing uh, ways, uh, ways of handling engineered hydrography in our, uh, particularly in our sort of urban desert areas where NHD has been lacking for forever, um, and providing linkages to uh, uh, related external data sets like the National Wet, Wet National Wetlands Inventory, uh, geology data sets uh, and other other infrastructure uh, data sets. Um, as Sue mentioned, we're not doing this in a vacuum. Uh, the prioritization and the uh, functions that we're trying to build into 3DHP are driven by uh, what we found in the HRBS requirements study several years ago. Um, and one of the key aspects of that is uh, generalization and really of an innate inherent generalization capability within the data set that doesn't, uh, doesn't exist in the NHD today. Uh, but we have, we have users uh, across you know, a range of uh, scales and project scopes uh, that need to have appropriate data. Uh, we need to be able to provide that. Um, we mentioned spatial accuracy. You know, the, the mapping world is just different uh, post 3 depth than it was in the days of you know, plane tables and theatolites. Um, uh, then we have some of those other uh, some of those other items down there that uh, maybe a little more application specific. Uh, but one of the big ones um, we're going to touch on is streamflow permanence. Uh, we're going to be able to provide that as a uh, continuous variable, a quantifiable value that uh, that users can classify as they need for their uh, for their own application. Uh, you know what a, a fisheries biologist might consider um, a. a uh, Intermittent stream isn't necessarily the same as what uh, someone looking at benthic invertebrates would consider an intermittent stream, and we want to provide them a, a numeric value, and they can draw those thresholds where uh, where they want, uh, where they need it for their applications. Uh, and that's really the the heart of this whole exercise uh, is to drive applications of uh, water science, water management. Um, you know, the NHD plus medium res is widely used today uh, across the country. You see a, a, an example of that running in the upper, hopefully you see it running in the upper right corner uh, with the national water model. Um, this is a prediction across about two and a half million uh, stream features in the country. Um, you know, a massive, a massive improvement from, you know, the few thousand uh, forecast points they had uh, before that. But with uh, NHD plus high res and then subsequently 3DHP, we can really push that uh, forecast horizon to a whole, you know, to a, a neighborhood or even building sort of level. Um, and we see an example of uh, a simulation in the lower right where you know, we can really start to talk about you know, specific trees that are inundated based on uh, the lighter available. I mean, maybe the tree doesn't particularly care, but if that was your, if that was your building, uh, if that's a road that needs that might or might not be passable for an emergency vehicle. That's, uh, that's really information that uh, has not, hasn't been available, uh, hasn't been predictable uh, before, and is fairly exciting potential. Um, another, another aspect that we really want to emphasize is interoperability. Um, taking, you know, working with NHD and something else 
uh, any other data set has always been a little bit of a challenge. Um, but uh, we really want to work to be able to do uh, better, you know, better connections, particularly to other aspects of the hydrologic cycle, uh, things like groundwater, uh, things like uh, national wetlands inventory, uh, but also components that um, help inform those processes, things like, you know, things like geology and land cover. Um, and then obviously we've been talking off and on for a while about uh, inland bathymetry uh, as sort of a future, uh, future component of 3D HP and 3D NTM. So where we go over the next couple of years, and we'll elaborate on most of these points in the next few slides, um, is, is going to involve some change. Um, during 2023, so that's our coming fiscal year starting in October, uh, we want to you know, stand up a 3D HP 1.0 data model. I think there'll be, it probably won't be the last version of the data model, but we want to put something up and start working with it. And we plan to populate that with uh, the EDH data that we have already validated uh, and are in the process of acquiring. Uh, by controlling what goes in on the front side of the database, I think we'll have, we'll have a lot fewer issues uh, with the data once it's in the database or when it goes to be used in applications. Uh, to support that, uh, that somewhat sparse population of data, uh, we are going to use a pruned version of the NHD uh, to connect these uh, areas of EDH data uh, that have been collected so that, for instance, it's collected in central Pennsylvania, can be routed effectively down to the Chesapeake Bay, uh, even if you don't necessarily have that same level of detail all the way down uh, to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, 2024, uh, we expect there'll be you know, fairly rapid revisions uh, to the data model right out of the gate. There's going to be things that, that work and don't work, and we need to uh, we'll need to address those, um, but pretty promptly we want to re release a data service um, and start providing user user and particularly uh, uh, user tools to work against that service. Uh, so these are things like uh, hydro addressing, uh, migrating that hydro ad capability that we have now with NHD to work against 3D HP. Uh, that's uh, the markup functionality that we've developed for NHD to work against 3D HP. Uh, that's uh, developing um, hydrologic unit scheme uh, in 3DHP. Uh, and then uh, also working on um, criteria for including uh, good quality uh, pre-EDH -E pre data sets. Uh, so a number of, number of states have done work over the years uh, with uh, maybe not, maybe data that hasn't been specifically to the EDH specifications, but has been to uh, uh, based on imagery or based on uh, LIDAR collections, and uh, it was very good quality. And we need to, we need to evaluate uh, how to include those data sets uh, within uh, 3DHP and then what modifications or what, um, what improvements, what adjustments might need to be made uh, to make that work. Uh, so I mentioned the data model earlier. Uh, this is going to be a fairly large de uh, departure from where we've been with NHD. Um, the new data model for 3 dhp will be based on OGC's high features uh, conceptual model. And this is really, as in a lot of ways, is a catch vent or you know, watershed view of hydrologic systems rather than a stream channel specific view uh, that we've had in the NHD for forever. Um, but the, the idea here is to provide, um, to provide, again, better linkages to the hydrologic reality uh, and maybe less concern about uh, how people have built things you know, around or in the water. Uh, there are many of those things that might have been represented in cartographic maps. Uh, moving this direction, obviously, it's an open data standard, uh, uh, international data standard. And this promotes interoperability with uh, our partners at NOAA and the National Water Model, EPA, uh, with other, other parts of USGS, and with um, Canada. And we have fairly regular coordination with, uh, with Canada to talk about their development of uh, data model on a similar, on the same, uh, same structure and uh, talk about how those uh, will interface and hopefully be easier to reconcile across the border. Um, again, this, this uh, uh, high features concept really supports uh, multi-scale data um, natively in a, in a manner that's roughly similar to uh, the way WBD hydrologic units nest 
And so um, you can, it makes it much easier to uh, assign attributes across uh, right, from a smaller uh, feature to a, a larger, more generalized feature. Um, and also, um, we're also going to simplify the data model uh, fairly dramatically in terms of the features that are actually carried within it. Right now, we carry about 175 distinct uh, F codes within the NHD data model. Um, and that really is a challenge in a lot of ways. Um, that data model, uh, again, you know, if anything was kind of waterish or watery, it found a place uh, from the topo map, from the topo map, it found a place in the NHD. And that includes a lot of different things that um, are, you know, maybe aren't, certainly aren't updated regularly, uh, but are also things that maybe don't really belong in a national hydrography data set or in a, in a functional hydrologic modeling context. And these are things like a lot of different flavors of pipelines with 24 different kinds of re reservoirs, including swimming pools. Um, and we have a lot of other, a lot of other 170 odd other features uh, that knock around in there this just, it creates a lot of burden for uh, developing and maintaining the tools that manipulate the data. Uh, it creates a burden for users trying to, uh, trying to interpret and understand the data. We get fairly regular emails, you know, asking questions about, uh, you know, details of the data model that aren't necessarily intuitive to a, a casual user. And so 3DHP is gonna go with a much simpler uh, data structure, data model. And you know, on the right here, we have what we currently have, what we currently have in NHD, uh, you know, all 170 uh, different F codes. Uh, on the left, we are still revising, uh, uh, developing the data model for uh, 3DHP, but it's going to look a lot more like the schema that we used for the elevation derived hydrography. It's something more on the order of you know, 15 to 20 uh, feature types carried you know, natively in the data model rather than 170 some. Uh, mentioned populating with uh, EDH data. One of, the, one of the key concepts here is to try to control the data uh, going into uh, 3DHP, um, make sure that's uh, of good quality um, so we don't have to do uh, so much work on it down the road. Uh, so we're going to start uh, the populating data model with, you know, data that we validated through our inspection process. And this, this will provide a, a, I can provide a lot of data in Alaska and uh, some data in CONUS to uh, demonstrate the concepts. Um, and similarly, you know, anytime you're doing work on, anytime you're doing work on hundreds of millions of features, it's probably going to take longer than doing work on, you know, millions or tens of millions of features. So it does limit the scope, um, particularly in the early part of uh, 24, uh, late 23, when we may be doing uh, manipulations and some changes to our processes. We won't have to you know, touch 300 million features. Um, again, we'll evaluate other data sources that may be you know, good quality, but not quite to the uh, elevation drive hydrography specifications, and then connect these areas uh, of dense, uh, good data with you know, a skeleton to provide routing and uh, enable some of the continental applications to start to use the data um, even as we fill in the network over the next several years. So as I mentioned, if we, if we do more of the validation up front, hopefully we'll have to do less editing in the future. Uh, and that's uh, sort of a key concept behind the data improvement uh, approach here. Rather, so rather than um, having lots of editors distributed across the landscape uh, and you know, relying on states and local local partners to both have knowledge of their local hydrology and have have active skills and uh, be able to work within our somewhat challenging tool set for editing data. Uh, we're going to do most of the most of the editing through markups and USGS will take on that uh, data editing role uh, so that will not be a, that won't be a shared or shared burden anymore. Um, but that, what that does, hopefully, is uh, lower the burden to providing um, improvements to the data, right? So rather than, again, rather than having to be versed in the software and have, have the right version of Arc, ArcGIS on your desktop and have all the right things installed to be able to edit the NHD, uh, you'll actually, you know, 
a user who's maybe a fisheries ecologist or a forester or you know wetlands biologist or whatever somebody will be able to go out and you know observe something in the field or say no you know that 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 should be that should be you know, some other feature type or that should be um that doesn't connect through there or that does connect whatever uh they provide the that change through a markup interface and then uh Edit, edits will be queued and then made at USGS, uh, so that uh, that's again that's not a burden. It's you know held across the community, um, and those uh, would plan to bring that markup functionality online uh, in late 24. Um, data distribution is again going to be a different approach uh, from what we've done in the past. Uh, NHD was definitely uh, con definitely conceptualized as a as a downloadable product. Uh, and we've since provided it as, as a service. Um, really with 3DHP, we want to provide services first so that everybody has access to uh, not just the latest, but the same version of the data. I really limit the branching uh, that happens when people download data and um, you know, make changes on their own version and then it doesn't match up with whatever they're trying to, trying to submit to a, work with a federal agency or work with a partner who's got a different version of the data. Uh, we really we want to be able to use a common set of data um, for for all these applications like the Internet of Water, uh, where we really need to be working on the same road network, not you know a different road network, right? Um, and then for purposes largely of research, uh, we will provide annual static releases of the data uh, so that people can reference you know I conducted this study with this version from 2024 and here's you know here's the data if uh, if you want to go try it yourself uh, so in terms of implementation and moving forward uh, much of the governance again mirrors what's being done uh, what's been done for 3 dep and those uh, those uh, functions are uh, being stood up and will run for like, run for the foreseeable future um, We've been working on pilots for a number of years uh, to collect data or we are operationally collecting data uh, to that EVH standard in Alaska now and I hope to move that to CONUS. Uh, in CONUS, the NHD plus high res um, is sort of subject to resource availability. Uh, so you know, there may be updates uh, in 2023 to NHD plus high res, but it's gonna be a lower priority than uh, meeting our GPRA goal, uh, which involves new production in Alaska, uh, and then transitioning into uh, 3DHP production uh, in 24. So that's that's an area of change. Um, Sue talked a lot about the acquisition and specifications components. Um, and then we are uh, putting together the, the data model and the operations plan with really an internal uh, plan on how how data moves through our network and in, internally to the NGTOC, and then uh, developing the data production and management systems. Uh, it's going to be an ongoing task uh, that goes for goes for quite a while. Um, okay, and then over the next couple of years, uh, there are there's going to be a transition period where we need to scale back what we've been doing with NHD WBD and NHD Plus High Res to you know, make room for 3DHP. Um, and so some of the changes that are on the, on the horizon here, um, we will continue to accept queued markups uh, for NHD and WBD. Uh, but at this point, it, those markups need to be in by November 30th uh, to get implemented. Beyond that, it's gonna be subject to, again, subject to resource availability. Um, we're going to phase out uh, state steward editing uh, during the first quarter of FY23. And so, you know, this is going to, you know, this is new editor tra training, this is job checkouts, um, and this is access uh, to the database uh, for uh, states. The uh, similarly, we'll have a phase out to WBD, but frankly, because the tools for WBD are uh, less complex uh, and less entwined than the tools for NHD. Uh, that window is a little longer out to June 30th of next year. Um, we will we will all work on NHD plus high res after we meet our GPRA goals 
and that's subject a little bit to resource availability. If we if if hitting the GPRA goals goes better than planned, we may have some room, but um, that's the commitment is just to hit the GPRA goals for that for this year. Um, and then at the end of next year, after we've made made all the markups and uh, tidied up the databases, we'll publish static versions of NHD WBD and NHD plus high res. And those will be available you know, for a long time. I think, think back to uh, the start of 3DEP when uh, we populated the database with, you know, with interpreted 10 meter NED data. Um, this base NHD and WBD rules continue to exist um, for supporting functions like HydroAd um, for you know, uh, several years to come uh, until we get 3D HP uh, up and populated widely. Um, and so that's, um, that's going to be, it'll be a static data set, but it'll be you know, available for use. Um, and then uh, in, in 23, sort of keeping online with that, uh, we're going to add the, the batch QC for line events uh, to hydro add. And so this is, this is uh, a lot, you know, working with lots of line events. Uh, and that'll, we'll develop that in 23, that'll work against NHD as long as NHD is available. And then uh, in 24, we'll transition hydro add to work with the 3D HP da data model uh, and actually work with both data models. Uh, but it will will transition that to work uh, with 3D HP and you know, move forward on uh, implementing the Internet of Water and that that uh, structure. And I think with that, that's the end of the show. Uh, so we have um, I would have some time for questions. Certainly, thank you both, Steve and Sue, uh, for that information. It's a lot to take in. Uh, I think the first question we had was from Frank Winters, and Frank is asking, how much internal capacity do you expect to keep up with the markups? Um, I, so you're looking for a, an FTE count? I mean, we, we, think, we think we have internal capacity to keep up with the markups. I guess if you know, somebody dumped millions of them on us, then, then you know, we might have to reevaluate that. Um, but we think that's... Um, we think that's, um, we think we have the capacity to do it. All right, Steve Sharp, are you able to come off of mute? Uh, it might be easier if you asked your question. Uh, sure, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Steve. Yeah, so um, I guess I could, my, my question was, you, you touched on some of the challenges of the the current NHD program in terms of the capacity of stewards, some that may have more capacity than others to update and maintain NHD. And you mentioned the, I think your strategy is to get away from that approach and use markups and have centralized editing instead. Um, my question is how do you, given that the goal of the 3D uh, H, um, P is, is to have synchronization between the hydrography and the elevation model. Uh, what's your strategy for ensuring synchronization as over time as streams meander? Well, one of the, I mean, a key component of the strategy is not to, not to just do it once and let it sit for 40 or 50 years um, as, as it's happened in a number of you know, places where you talk about moldy stream data. Um, eventually, Right now, we're, we're just getting the hydrography program going, but eventually, um, sort of within the 3D NTM concept, uh, we'd expect to see these move much more closely together um, as, you know, as new LIDAR is collected either on a, on a regular cycle or on a, as, in response to an event, uh, we might see uh, hydrography you know, updated you know, at the, you know, on, off of that updated elevation data set. So I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of it will, will depend on the underlying, uh, on the update of the under, underlying elevation data. Um, but I think we're con conceptualizing this as an ongoing, you know, an ongoing sort of rolling program. 
I don't know, Sue, this is, do you want to uh, jump in on that? And no, I think you you covered it. I will say that um, it's to be determined, but one of the things that 3DEP is looking at um, as they explore options for next generation 3DEP is, um, is there a changed base way of triggering a new um, elevation acquisition? And I don't know what the outcomes will be of that, but I think that would be useful in this, in the idea of, you know, if there's changes in the hydrography, which we know there are, um, that those can be captured maybe more quickly than they certainly would be otherwise. So TBD, but it's one thing to keep in mind. All right, uh, Jeff Langella asks, can you expand on pruned NHD? Uh, the state of New York has performed tens of thousands of pond additions that do not meet the new specs for 3DHP, including lakes, ponds that are under two acres and don't contain Z vertices. Will these ponds be removed from 3DHP? Well, so that, touch, that touches two separate pieces. That pruned network is just sort of the, uh, the, the main stem skeleton that we need to put into to route from areas of, of improved data to areas to, to the oceans. Um, so they probably would not exist in the pruned data set. However, if you have, uh, if you've made um, uh, if you have areas of good quality data that, you know, that you've delineated from imagery, for example, or from other sources, uh, that data can be, um, we can look at migrating that data into 3DHP. That's part of that, um, part of that sort of second phase that um, I talked about. The other component of that is that obviously if these, these edits will continue to live on in the NHD for, again, for the foreseeable future. Um, and so that's, um, you know, they'll be you know, accessible and available uh, through NHD for, for at least several years to come. All right, Jay Stevens asks, why remove the headwater streams to form a skeleton in the new 3DHP partially populated data set? I think many users are going to need a seamless best available data letter, layer for hydrography. Mostly because the, the headwater areas are the areas where there's most likely to be conflict with, uh, well, those are the most, the most changeable areas. Uh, they're most likely to have conflict with the elevation data on those, those smallest features. I uh, really the, the purpose of that skeleton is again just to route uh, flow from those uh, improved areas to, to the, the downstream terminus. Um, and so we have for a while um, that best available might be the NHD. Uh, but as we get more uh, more data collections, uh, both both acquired and then incorporated into 3DHP. And we plan to, you know, we hope that becomes the best available data set. So Steve, yeah, I, I guess what I'm hearing in both these last questions is this um, commitment to integrate these data resources past mm -hmm. this prune skeleton. Is that a correct interpretation? Yeah, I think there, and, and as Sue mentioned, and I suspect many people on the call know, there's a really wide range of data available in, uh, in the NHD right now. Um, everything from blue lines that were captured, you know, before I was born, um, on, you know, on paper and then you know, digitized and then you know, I don't know, you know, reprojected. Was, lots of different things have happened to those lines over the years. And they're but they're still, I mean, they're the best available in many parts of the country. Uh, and then there are, there are places where uh, we've done these, these EDH projects in the last couple of years. And there are places where people have gone in and done uh, very large scale updates of uh, hydrography based on, uh, for instance, the uh, six inch imagery or on uh, LIDAR, just that happened before the EDH specifications were available. And that, sort of that second set, that area where people have done high quality uh, updates, um, you know, we, don't, we don't want to lose those or exclude those um, I don't, it automatically. Those are, those are data sets we really want to look at uh, working to bring in um, 
you know, if they can, particularly if we can get uh, Z values associated with them, that uh, X, Y, Z value um, structure of the, is gonna be, it's gonna be important within uh, 3D HP. And so that's, um, that's something we might have to look at uh, more on a data set by data set kind of basis um, through time. But that's, I mean, yes, we do, we do wanna bring in Good quality data sets that people have been working on the last uh, last few years. Uh, Josh Greenberg asks, will the funding model for 3DHB be similar to 3DEF, where regions are asked to match the BAA funding, usually in that 25 to 40 percent range? I'll take this one, Steve. Yep, uh, Josh, you. yes, in short, that's that's the model as we noted. Um, this will need to be a community investment in the same way that 3DEP is a community investment. And we are um, hopeful, although not certain, of um, funding this year to stand up a BAA. But as soon as we have funding, we, will, we are working on the, the, um, the paperwork, basically, to get a BAA um, for 3DHP stood up. And it will... Um, have a, a, a requested match from the applicant in this case. Jones Osman asks, where does Alaska fit into the timeline you present? Well, that's, that's kind of a good news, bad news story for Alaska. Obviously, we're doing a lot of improvements in Alaska, um, and Alaska will have some of the first 3DHP data sets because we've been doing those uh, elevation-derived hydrography projects up there for the last several years. Uh, the, so the bad news side of it is um, we'll be collecting data in Alaska for many years to come. Um, I don't recall exactly. I forget what the... the Horizon, our, our uh, Alaska mapping manager, Tracy Fuller, laid out. But it's something like eight more years, I think, um, to get through collection in Alaska. Uh, so you'll have, you'll, you might be both the first and, you know, one of the last uh, hot gates to, or, uh, you know, watersheds to get added to the 3DHP. Um, but we're definitely, we're, we're happy to have a lot of data ready to, you know, ready to bring online in Alaska. Um, and you'll at least be at the, fr at the front end. All right, I'll let you interpret this one from Eric Jesperson. Is this approach attracting interest? Would you like that or would you like me to do that, Sue? Uh -huh. I can take that. Um, Eric, yes, it is um, attracting interest and we're, we're talking to our federal partners through our governance group, the 3DHP Working Group. Uh, and we certainly have interest, um, uh, particularly from NRCS, as you may well know, in, in Pennsylvania, um, and also um, uh, some pretty well stated interest in, uh, from FEMA to understand how 3DHP will help with their um, next generation of, of um, uh, flood modeling that they're working on. Um, and EPA is also uh, interested, and in, we have uh, a great collaboration with the USGS Water Mission Area. Uh, they're supporting um, some of the work that Steve et al. have been doing on the data model. So um, long way of saying, yes, there's, there's interest from additional federal partners, and we hope to, um, over the long term, again, similar to 3DEP, um, uh, leverage additional federal funding uh, to, to boost the um, data acquisition as we start to build um, momentum on the, pro uh, the on the program. Frank Winters asks, "Will edits will edits we are making now in NHD be orphaned? Many of the NHD improvements are smaller water bodies. Water body names, I think, similar to what Jeff was asking earlier." No, no. Yeah, those. If you're making edits in NHD, they will they they, they will be reflected in that final version uh, that's published. Well, they'll, they'll be reflected shortly after they're made, and then they'll uh, be present in that uh, static version we publish at the end of next fiscal year. Um, so that's. I mean, they're not orphaned. They're they're there, uh, and then we can talk about whether those we can evaluate whether those data whether those areas are. Uh, what might need to happen to them to bring them in uh, with Z values or to, to uh, 
bring them in as provisional data into 3DHP. Uh, Josh Greenberg says, Washington State is not able to put a lock on hydro improvements and connecting our event data. Can you provide any interim support or data model that we could use until 3DHP is up and running? Well, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, sort of two sides to that question, I suppose. In terms of uh, uh, connecting our event data, that I mean, the again, NHD and the HydroEd tools uh, and HydroLink too, for that matter, will continue to you know, run and be available for the foreseeable future. So the, the addressing component against the network uh, will be there. What, what we're gonna lose is some window of updating um, that network. And so um, in that interim, there, yeah, in that interim, I don't really have um, a great answer for areas that need to be, areas where you need to add a feature, for example, uh, that isn't on the network, and that's um, that's I mean, that's a area of challenge here. We you know, we don't see how that we don't see, but we don't see how uh, to fit that in. We're just trying to minimize the gap when that's uh, when that data is unavail when that functionality is unavailable. Uh, Dustin Witt, we're ask we're ex we've experienced significant challenges in utilizing IFSAR to make EDH reflect reality in the large dense forest of coastal Alaska. Ground and canopy separation from IFSAR has been problematic. What solutions do you suggest for this area to ensure the data reflects reality? Yeah, no, there are definitely, I mean, there are definitely places, uh, and they, they particularly in Alaska, um, where we're gonna run into challenges. Uh, and there's um, one of the, one of the concepts we're working with uh, is data that uh, you know that meets the specifications with a variance. Um, you know, maybe an, an increased tolerance from the data model, or from the I'm sorry, maybe an increased tolerance from the digital surface model based on uh, again based on this canopy coverage issue, or um, uh, that there are you know there are other uh, I don't know other additional allowances that need to be made because of the ground conditions in that area. Um, but we wanna make sure we have those um, well documented and well understood, uh, again, towards understanding the quality of the data that goes into the data set um, in advance, right? So that we know what we're working with and what, uh, and more importantly, our, our users and consumers know what they're getting. All right, um, as we've mentioned, we like to keep the program to one hour and we have we graciously, graciously ask our host to stay on another 30 minutes. So uh, for those that you have to leave on the hour, uh, just thank you again. Uh, please note the form is available. The third, we're gonna continue, don't worry. And if your question, if we don't get to it during the hour and a half, we will still con uh, contribute that question to USGS to include in the Q&A doc we produce. Uh, we will not be having a September forum because the data for the it would be time for our quarterly meeting and instead we'll be ha holding the quarterly meeting as the data for the nation breakout at the NISJIC annual conference. We are looking for a presentation for October. We've had a shift in um, presentation. So if you're interested in presenting at the October 19th forum, please contact me. We're especially interested in a state-based presentation uh, and that could be a state with its private sector partner um, because we've got federal presentations this month and then lined up again for November. So with that said, we'll go back to the questioning, uh, but thank you all for uh, joining us. So with that, I believe the next question was from Zachary Cantor. EDH is particularly challenging in urban, suburban, WI, WUI, and deserts. How do you anticipate 3DHP via EDH will work in these areas? Well, so there, yes, there are a number of places where uh, EDH can be challenging. Uh, I think where maybe particularly related to the urban suburban component, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what WUI stands for. Um, but one of the real features of the 3DHP data model is to be able to provide uh, logical connections to uh, logical connections between features 
when you don't necessarily have all the plumbing uh, that's necessary to get between them. And so this applies uh, applies to karst features, certainly applies to uh, urban features where you know, you know water goes in a catch basin somewhere and then it comes out at an outfall someplace else, but you don't necessarily you know, know how to pipe it from, from one to the other. Um, being able to provide that logical connection um, actually improves things considerably uh, in terms of making that data you know, functional and useful. Um, and, and that um, sort of drawing the uh, delineations and maybe particularly the catchments uh, is going to be something that you know is probably uh, incorporates a lot of local knowledge or local um, input. Um, I think I'd I think I'd refer at this point to our uh, the work that was done in DC a couple of years ago. Um, maybe I, you know hope probably not every urban project needs to be quite that detailed, but uh, they encountered and, and documented a lot of the. Uh, challenges that are involved in this sort of work. That does help, uh, Steve and uh, Shauna Ray uh, added a little note to saying that WUI is Wild Land Urban Interface. Oh, okay. So, uh, next question, from Dennis Peterson. Any estimate date on when the first 3D HBA will be released regarding BAA proposals? Will Huck 10 watersheds be the minimum geographic area for data collection? And Dennis or Steve, I'll take this. Um, and Thank also, you. I hopefully this will also address Jeff Levin's uh, question all in one fell swoop. Um, we don't know yet, frankly, when the BAA will be released. It's all dependent on funding for the program. Uh, there was a small plus up in the president's budget um, to stand up the program. But uh, with anybody familiar, we don't know if that will make it all the way through the budget process. We are very hopeful that it will. Um, and then we will, we will do an amendment to the 3 debt BAA uh, and uh, get the 3 dhp BAA as soon as possible pending funding. Uh, and, and Dennis, you are correct, and that's a really good point to make. Um, Huck 8s are uh, preferred. Uh, for um, uh, 3HP BAA proposals when we, we stand up the BAA, uh, but we understand that you know that can be challenging, uh, particularly for smaller states or for states where there's very large hub gates that cross um, state boundaries. So we will go um, down to hub tens um, where necessary, but we certainly will uh, encourage you, our state partners, state and local partners. Uh, where possible to put together um, multi-state uh, or cross-state funding coalitions to get those huck tins that cross boundaries. And it is very important to understand that um, we will require whole um, hydrologic unit boundaries, no cutting at um, state boundaries uh, will be allowed. We need to get the whole hydrologic unit. Hopefully that answers both Dennis and Jeff. If I could, I got a follow up on that too. Sure, Dennis. So one of the challenges being a state employee for procurement is we may have an issue with um, HUC 10 or HUC 8s that go outside of the state boundary mm. uh, and funding uh, collections not within the state. Um, so that, that, that could be a real challenge, not just for me, but for other state coordinators. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I guess the uh, question I would have for you is: is that is it possible when we have federal matching dollars um, to make sure that the federal match on any of those areas covers the area that goes outside your state boundary? Would that be a reasonable um, justification for your state, or no? I'd have to research that. It's a possibility. Okay. Yeah, let's dig into that because that's an important distinction or nuance that we'll need to, to chase down before we um, settle in on a hard and fast rule. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Yep. Jeff, you can speak up if your question was not addressed. Jeff Lovin. No, no, thank you very much, Sue. That helps. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. We'll, we'll get everybody information as soon as it happens. <laughs> 
Yeah, Great. somehow cut off Jim G's question. I'm trying to go back. Oh, here. For us state people, what would be the expectation? Okay, for partnerships with 3DHQ, will collection of culvert locations be included in partnership programs and partnership funding? I'll say, Steve, you may have a better answer for this, but I will say, I mean, cutting through and um, at culvert locations so that we have flow where flow is appropriate is really important. Um, and I believe our uh, gypsy contractors who've been doing this work, and those of you on the line or Steve can correct me if I'm wrong, um, source culvert locations where they're available as they're doing this work. Uh, and then identify culverts where there um, are or likely to be as, as we go through. I don't know if that answers your question or Steve, if you have elaboration on that. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll elaborate that, um, I mean, cul understanding where the culverts are, uh, yeah, is important and kind of inherent in maintaining uh, monotonic flow downstream. And so, um, yeah, the, if we're collecting, if we're doing a, uh, doing an EDH collection, uh, we're going to we're going to find the culverts. That's uh, kind of unavoidable, I suspect. And right. Jim, I don't, oh sorry, Linda, I don't no, know go if ahead. you addressed your the first part of your question, so I don't know if you need to come off mute um, and elaborate on what you mean by what will be the expectation for partnerships. Thanks, Sue. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, are, are states just kind of, you know, uh, expected to, to send money or are there other things we can do? And, and I was sort of thinking the culvert thing uh, in particular, because it takes, if, if you're doing a field survey with those things, it takes so long to, to collect them uh, that it could, you know, be a multi-year process sometimes to, to even get a, you know, first cut on those. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering, um, you know, who, how we should sort of be thinking of how we're going, as a state, how we're going to be interacting um, in, in this process. Yeah, I got it. For the, I'll say for the BAA process, I think <laughs> the will states be expected to spend, send money is sort of at the moment how we envision it. Um, it's difficult to take in kind sort of um, contributions to these kinds of projects. And so those are that, you know, especially in the early days, I think we need to rule out in kind work okay. particularly for gypsy projects. So yeah, but of course, we need your knowledge and network and expertise to make this successful. Okay. Yeah, you, you sniffed out that in-kind thing. That's, <laughs> that's where I was I spent, getting at. <laughs> I spent enough time on 3DEP. I can, I can feel it coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, Jeff Langella asks, will stewards be able to bulk upload water body improvements and additions through the 3DHP markup? New York State is currently focusing on reviewing existing water bodies and adding LIDAR derived water bodies. It would be good if we could still make these improvements and maybe not focus on the smaller water bodies we've been adding in recent years. You know, I just, if I'm going to suggest actually maybe Jeff that we we should talk uh, we should talk offline because it sounds like you have maybe got uh, work going on in New York that um, that might be useful to you know we could we could probably uh, help uh, strategize a little bit um, you know bulk markups are you know are, I think are a possibility but uh, if you're in the process of making those edits um, you know maybe we can maybe we can again, help, uh, you know, help you come up with a, uh, a plan for that. Get those, you know, get those okay. NHD, you know, early on. I, okay. I will facilitate yep. that Thanks. connection, so. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Um, next question from Eric. Should we expect the first BAA to include 
I'm sorry, just Eric Jesperson, not just Eric. Uh, should we expect the first BAA to include 3D HP late summer 2023? Any linkage between the applications for 3DEP and 3D HP, or would they be separately resourced? And Sue, I believe you touched on this, but if you could elaborate. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, you know, again, timing, we don't know. Late summer, frankly, would be too late um, because there's time to get agreements in place and contracting. Uh, so hopefully we have a, a federal budget that includes a plus up for this work um, soon enough that we can move into a BAA uh, with time to put together some projects. Um, at the moment, we don't envision a direct linkage between applications. Um, so the 3DHP will be a separate application. But for those of you uh, familiar with 3DEP, you will see um, that they will look very similar because why reinvent the wheel that's already been invented? Uh, but they won't be linked, not at least at the moment. All right, Phil asked, Phil Worrell, many states are already maintaining their own internal versions of NHD WBD data, such as headwater drainage ways, culverts, networks, et cetera. How do you envision this changing or continuing under 3DHP? I guess where I think I'd, where I think I'd see it, well, I guess ideally I'd see it um, maybe not continuing in that we, we would hopefully lower the barriers to entry uh, to putting good, you know, good data into the data set. It wouldn't be such a, such a burden to edit. Um, I think in terms of uh, attribution, and that goes uh, a little bit along with your, your earlier bubble there. Um, again, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, concept here will be to provide um, the network and uh, sort of the flow logic. Uh, if you want to, um, I mean, whether you want to specify uh, uh, a periodicity um, attribute or specify a um, something particular about the network, um, you know, that, that would, would, I think most of that would envision happening uh, as address data as, as uh, an event. Um, rather than you know, rather than being a, a distinct type of feature, you know, the sort of right now we have you know distinct features for perennial streams, for intermittent streams, and for ephemeral streams. So yeah, you get up one one flow line that's three different features. Uh, we kind of want to get away from that. From F Biles, uh, one actually, I'm gonna yeah we can do this one meter nationwide question mark is there a plan for one meter elevation data for alaska also the five meter if so in alaska has major vegetation removal issues especially along streams that results in derived hydrography that does not meet the usgs 3h 3dhp requirements the if -SAR has been proving to be ill-suited for hydro hydro hydrology modeling how will this be addressed so I'm going to jump in real quick and say part of that's my bad. I keep forgetting to say our five meter in Alaska currently. So we have one meter um, for CONUS, the islands and territories, but currently, as you note, five meter uh, IFSAR in Alaska. Um, higher resolution data is TBD as the 3 debt program works through their next generation scenarios. Um, and then Steve, I'll throw it to you for any other comments. Yeah, I think I, the right. So right now we're we're working with the five meter data we have. Um, if you know, if uh, better elevation data becomes available through the next generation of three depth, uh, or then we'll work on um, work on uh, adjusting the Alaska plan uh, to work from that data. And yeah, there are uh, again there. Better, better and worse places uh, to work with the, to do hydrologic modeling from IFSAR in Alaska. Um, it works better in some places than others. And we will, you know, again, we're talking about uh, these sort of variance classifications for places where, um, where the data just, the, particularly the elevation data, uh, just don't make um, interpretation of the hydrologic network uh, uh, workable. And so we'll have to, you know, we'll have to evaluate that, um, you know, as sort of probably 
you know, hawk to hawk or project to project. Um, Bill ask again, and you may have already addressed this with the concept of features versus attributes. Um, Bill ask if stream periodicity would be an internal attribute of 3D HP or convert it to an extent or an external hydro address feature attribute. States have maintained their own internal versions of this. Uh, how do you envision this changing or continuing under 3D HP? Right. So I think I think um, I think we. I think I caught, I thought I caught that, but that yeah yeah, yeah okay did. okay okay so that's addressed. Thank it you. Sounded familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jeff Langella asks, "Will project costs differ in different areas if we spent a lot of time to get water bodies within Huck Eight in line for NHD? Will the cost be less since most of the work will focus on flow line?" I mean, I, I guess I will say that project costs will differ based on the terrain you're working in. Um, I don't know, Sue, if you want if you want to field any of the rest of that or not. No, other than to say then I think that's right. And we don't we don't yet um, have full handle on costs and you know we'll get a better handle uh, on how costs differ across landscapes as we work through this. I think very similar to um, as three depth stood up. Um, and it's possible, uh, Jeff, that because you've done so much work already to get your um, water bodies in line, yeah, um, if they're based on the LIDAR data um, and they're aligned, then it's possible. We can't guarantee that the cost would be less, but I would suspect that it's possible because that's less work that a, that a contractor would have to do. All right. Uh, Steve Sharp asks, discontinuing maintenance of NHD in the near term, quarter one of 2023, could be problematic for engaged stewards, such as Washington, given that 3DHP is really only conceptual at this time. Why not wait until 3DHP is mature enough to replace the NHD, which I suspect will take longer than projected? Yeah, it, it's... Um... It's really a resource problem. Um, if we could run both in parallel, um, we would. But when we started looking at what we needed to make uh, 3DHP happen and try, try to minimize the, it, the likelihood that it would take longer than projected, um, we needed to shift resources and you know, particularly the data management resources and the, the uh, developer resources that maintain the tools and the, the database um, functions, uh, we need to shift those off of um, NHD support and onto uh, 3DHP development. So it's, you know, it's not, we realize it's not an ideal situation, um, but it's uh, where we are based on uh, the resources we have. Marian Davis asks, if third-party vendors will be completing the work, how will the local knowledge be preserved? Do you want that or you want me to take that, Sue? Um, well, I will take a stab at it. Okay. I think that in the, the first, you know, when we're in a partnership with um, local uh, folks and, you know, other federal partners, et cetera, that's what it is as a partnership. And as, as um, the gypsy contractors in this case move through the data, you know, there's, there's opportunities um, as we validate the data to ask you questions uh, about where you may know information. And then, you know, sort of post facto, the idea that you can also go in and look at the data um, and uh, make suggested changes for USGS to edit through the markup tool uh, is, a, is a primary way that your local knowledge would be uh, brought to bear on the data set. And uh, Steve, did you have anything? No, I think, I, I think that covers it. Um, I think you know, the consultation during validation and then uh, work through the markup tool is, you know, yeah, that's it. 
So following on that, is that something that um, state and local partners should consider and develop and, or is that part of the gypsy contract or is there something special state and local partners to do can do to ensure that integration in the development process? No, if they're um, partners, uh, you know, funding partners or other types of partners, uh, I think we can we can work with them and with the caveat that we can't bottleneck the process. Um, and if there's, you know, chance to look at the data afterwards, if necessary, then markup would be the way to go. Uh, Marcella, are you still on? Would you like to come on? You had a comment you wanted to elaborate on one of the um, the information about the markup. Um, yeah, hi, I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, thank and, you. Uh, okay, great. Um, this was uh, just a follow-up comment to Jeff's earlier question about whether there will be a way to bulk upload improvements with 3D HP markup. So I provided a technical based, I, I'm the market product owner um, at NG Talk Denver. So, um, and I manage the markup app, the, the public facing web app for collecting markups. So this is my stab at a technical answer um, <laughs> for Jeff. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully markup for 3DHP, you know, I, from the info I have right now, I, I would anticipate a similar option, although since 3D HP, you know, we'll be focusing more on getting attribute input um, from partners than geometry. It, the process and any related tools might look different um, than what we're used to now. Um, but if Jeff, you are talking about getting your improvements into NHD um, before 3D HP at all, um, we do have an existing workflow for that. So please reach out to markup at usgs.gov. So thank you. Thank you, Marcel. All right, I think we're gonna get them. Uh, Jane Schaefer Kramer asked, will nested hydrologic, we only have two left, nested hydrologic units be part of 3DHP? Yes, yes, they will. We have a, there are a lot of, lot of uh, programs across all levels of government that rely on, uh, on those hydrologic units and uh, there, will be, uh, there will be hydrologic units in uh, nested hydrologic units even in 3D HP. Okay, Joanne Markert asked, can federal dollars be used in Canada? We have watersheds that extend across the border and how does the local knowledge get integrated into the process? I'm still unclear on the benefit to the states with this new approach. Well, I'll, I'll take the first part of it. Um, no, frankly, federal dollars, we don't have authority to map in Canada, but we harmony, harmonize the data across the border with the authoritative Canadian data set, um, which is currently the NHN, I believe, unless they've changed that. So we don't map across the data uh, that border, Canada does, and we um, work very closely with our Canadian partners to integrate those data. And then I guess I'm, yeah, I'm the benefits of the states with the approach. I think you know the benefits have been documented in our hydrography requirements and benefits study, and you know the alignment of the data with um, with the elevation data and spatial accuracy were a couple of the the most important benefits that um, the respondents in the to that study. Um, indicated was necessary for their applications to support their applications. So I think there's, you know, benefits to the states that, you know, we should, we might be need to dig out to, to discuss with you. And Steve, I don't know, do you have any other? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll well, the, on the Canadian item, um, as she's, she's entirely correct, but uh, one of the one of the attributes or one of the the benefits I mentioned uh, was that Canada is approaching this in a similar way, and we're we're uh, coordinating with them regularly. Um, so I, it's maybe a pipe dream at this point, but it's I think there's a very real possibility we get uh, much more regular and seamless harmonization with uh, Canada uh, in the future when they're you know, similarly on a high features based data model. Um, and the other, there are, I mean, we did a fairly extensive documentation of benefits, uh, you know, but that, that, that doesn't mean this isn't going to be disruptive um, 
you know, that's, uh, we're you know, trying to minimize the disruption with the resources we have, but, you know, this is, this is a fairly big, that is a big change. And um, we're going to be better off in, um, you know, on the other side of it, but the next, you know, the next year or so are going to be pretty, going to be pretty challenging. And then finally, I think we're going to do this. Uh, Mike asks, will Elevation Drive coastlines be incorporated into the 3DHP? Yes. Um, the coastline sort of specifically is a kind of brand name thing uh, is NOAA's domain, obviously, but uh, elevation derived, um, I don't know, edge of ocean or edge of or shoreline or where the, where the land stops. Uh, is uh, definitely uh, something that's going to be in uh, 3DHP and 3DNTM. Uh, there's a specification uh, in works describing that uh, somewhere. Okay, great. It's 428. I hope you will look at the end of the comments. Several thank yous, appreciations for you sharing your information. Um, yes, lots more. They're rolling in. And thank you for taking the time. They appreciated your candor. And your agility uh, at answering these That's questions. That's without Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all. Again, please remember, if you're able to attend the conference next um, month, we will continue this dialogue. And again, thank you, Sue and Steve, for joining us today and sharing this information. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody.